Amen. And before we get into our scripture, I want to share a couple of things with you. And I want to see if you know them. Okay. How do you put on the armor of God? Let me hear it loud so everybody else can hear it. Father, in Jesus' name, the armor comes right on you. Okay. Now, if you have a conversation where it's private and you really don't want the enemy to listen in, what should you say? Father, in Jesus' name, because when God comes around you and the armor comes down on you, Satan is now deafened and blinded to what you say and do. Now, if I were you and you seem to be under attack, you'd be saying, Father, in the name of Jesus, 80 times a day. <laughs> but anyway, I want you to know that. See, there are truths that happen when we apply the truth. But if we don't know the truth is there, then we can't experience the results of that truth. Here's another thing. When you're having problems in your body, this is one thing that people need to learn to practice, and sometimes it slips our mind. Learn to speak to your body. Father, in the name of Jesus, I command my body to function normally. For it to do exactly what God designed it to do. I command this pain to leave. You understand? Speak the word to your body. Speak it to your lungs if they're weak. Speak it to your legs if they're weak. You understand? You speak the word. And he sent forth his word and it healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. So learn at times you needed to speak. You might have to speak to your head. Function. <laughs> Amen. Are you guys blessed? I so, man, the word of God is so rich. It's so exciting. Amen. All right. And somebody said, well, pastor, I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, in these days, they're so crazy and they're squirrely and everything. He said, how is it that you want me to walk? I know you want me to walk in the spirit. And I'm telling God how he wants me to walk. And then it, God gets quiet when I'm telling him stuff. And so, but, but he tells me, he says, son, I want you to ask for me to help you stay humble and stay balanced. Look at somebody and say, stay humble, stay humble and stay balanced. stay balanced. That means you don't borrow from Peter to pay Paul. You stay balanced. You don't, uh, you know, steal from your sleep. We're going to go to Guinness. So, so you basically, how do you put on the armor? Make sure you get that down because I mean, that's a daily application. Learn to speak to your body. Sometimes that's a daily application too. Amen. And stay humble and be balanced. All right. Let me give you a couple of scriptures that are going to go along with our, our lesson. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands. We're not going on our lesson yet. Take heed lest he fall. That's a warning us to stay balanced. Because, you know, there's some things. I remember back when I was young, I'd get a few victories, or actually God got a few victories in my life. And I took my ease, and I just started to have a party attitude and say, oh, we could just, uh-uh, uh-uh. When everything's going your way, you keep everything under the blood. Can you say amen? Second little scripture I want to give you is Romans 12, 3. It says, this I say, don't think more highly than of yourself than you ought to think. Think soberly. Amen. Because when you're thinking high, we, we have a tendency, and I'm not faulting any of us, we have a tendency to talk down. I know that when I was, a, see, I've always been a boss my, almost my entire life. I've been an employee, but because it looks like people who are bosses, who want people to lead their, their work forces, want to pick people with brains. <laughs> anyway, I've always been picked to be a leader in something. Got me in big trouble, you know. But when you're leading, you can't become aggressive. You can't become demanding. You have to lead by example. Hello. Amen. If you want friends, you must show yourself friendly. to be friendly. Amen. So let me read this scripture. This is 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. And I'll probably bring up some of these later. But, but even if our gospel is veiled... It is veiled to those that are perishing, people that are not saved. Whose minds the God, little g, okay, of this age has blinded. Who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of Christ. How many know the Bible brings us light? Entrance of thy word. 
brings us light. The word is a lamp to our path and a light, excuse me, a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. Amen. All right, so I want to basically let you know. Here's our scripture for the week. This is one that I find a lot of people. How many here before you make a decision, seek God? If not, let me encourage you to. You're going to buy a car? Pray. <laughs> you're going to find a home? Pray. If you're single, this is for you single people watching, you're going to find a, a spouse or a partner in life? Pray. <laughs> you understand? Amen. So here we go. This is our scripture for the week. Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. Don't get all stressed out. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. Everyone say everything. everything. By prayer and supplication. That means petitioning. Lord, your word says. Lord, your word says. Lord, your word says. Lord, your word says. That's petitioning. You bring his word before him. Can God deny himself? No, when you bring the word before him, God answers himself. That's why we pray the word and not pray our problems. That's why we speak the word and not the obvious. There's a dog biting your leg. You don't say, oh, there's a dog biting my leg. The majority of human beings, that's what they do. They talk about what their experiences are right now instead of their hopes and their dreams, allowing and making peace with God so God helps them to get there. Someone say amen. amen. So be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Why should I have to do that, Pastor Curry? Because... We have not because we ask not. It's not that God doesn't know about them. He needs you to invite him in. Everyone say, invite God in. You see, what happens in a service like today, God was waiting here for you. He's waiting for you to invite him to be a part of your morning. He's waiting for you to invite him to be a part of your commute going to work. <laughs> Hello? He's, he has to have you ask him. How did you get him in your heart? You asked. You, he stood at the door and knocked, and you, you believed, and you opened the door, and you invited him in. God needs invitation because he's a gentleman. You don't invite him in. He waits patiently until he's invited in. So get that consummate. It's very powerful. Now, he says, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, remember, I told you that your heart was both, both your soul and your spirit. The outer man of the heart's your soul, your personality, your mind, your will, your intellect, your drives. And the inner part of your heart is your spirit. Let it be the hidden man of the heart which is acceptable to God. Can you see what I'm saying? Okay. So, and the peace of God surpasses your understanding will guard your hearts. Soon as your heart starts to get troubled, stop. Consult God. Go into the bathroom if you're at work. Flush the toilet and pray. <laughs> I mean, you can laugh. Right? Be wise. You're going into your relatives and everybody's mad at each other. Go right to the bathroom. Turn on the water and start praying over everything. They don't know what you're doing, but you're taking authority over the mess that Satan makes all the time. He's always making a mess. Amen. Don't you make a mess. You're acting like him. <laughs> Moving right along. All right. And the peace of God surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whenever you see a finally when Paul's writing, he means now, for the rest of you that got all that, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, my wife, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. In other words, today we're going to be talking about having our eyes enlightened. So we've been doing a new creatures reality series. This is the third one. Having your eyes enlightened. Everyone say, I need my eyes enlightened. 
How many of here ever done something and then one guy comes in, maybe he's done it for years, and he shows you a better way to do the very thing you've been doing? And you go, whoa, I didn't know I could do that. See, the eyes of you have become enlightened on something. When I found out that we have a walk so powerful in God, and if we stay in God, how protected we really are, how much scripture is really dedicated and what Jesus went through to really give us that, I found out that here we are. This is you and I. I know we look like an ugly piece of paper, right? You and I are hidden in Christ, in God. Now, don't get out of there. Stay in, amen? So what does Satan see? He sees God. You are in, you're hidden in the cleft of the rock. You are dwelling in the secret place. Amen? Say, that's me. So having our eyes in light is so important, all right? So let's get into this. Open your Bibles to Ephesians 1, please, verse 17 through 20. Do you ever remember hearing the scriptures as a man thinketh in his heart, so he becomes? Amen. If you perceive something to be a certain way, perceive means understand it to be, then you're going to see it in that light. It's, a, it's a, already a science performance, but they'll take um, something like a little flea or something and they'll put it in a little jar and they'll put a cap on it. And the fleas will jump up to that cap and, and they can't go out any further. So they will remove the cap and the fleas, because of their concept, won't jump anywhere past that even though the blockage is not there. So we're like the same thing. We've been conditioned in the negative. So we really need to have our eyes enlightened the way God looks at things. How should we look at one another? How should we look at this world? We do need to look at it. We don't need to embrace it and get our, you know, substance from it. But we do need to look at things. How should we look at them? What kind of thinking do we actually have? Let me ask you. It was said of John the Baptist when the Pharisees and the religious people came to confront him. They said, who are you and what are you saying about yourself? Think about that. We as Christians, what are we saying about ourselves? How do we see our, ourselves before the Lord? Yes. Hello, it's very important. So we want to build the proper image from the word of God of who God says that we are. Amen. Not what we experience per se, not what we, we, um, our feelings feel. We are who God says we are, but we need to have our eyes enlightened. Now, one of the words for enlighten is revelation. We need to have a revealing of something, a revelation of something. Can you say amen? We must learn to change the pictures of life with his word. We must line up our actions and our words with the word of God. And to do that, we have to spend time in it. Don't condemn yourself. Replace how we look at things and how we respond to life with how the word and how the spirit of God works in us. For example, how do you look at life? Do you look at it full of challenges? Even though maybe something has happened, I know with my foot, there were some challenges, but I went to God about it and he began to show me things. Keep, keep lifting up my eyes. Now there's a story about Elijah's prophet. I mean, excuse me, Elijah's servant. Elijah had a servant named Gehazi. And it turned out that they were in the city and they were surrounded by all of these enemy forces. And of course, the servant, he's about things. So he's outside getting water and everything. He looks out and he sees, oh my goodness, we are surrounded by the enemy. This is a good message to us. So he goes in and he tells everybody, he says, Elijah, we are surrounded by the enemy. Yes. And of course, I'm making a long story short. 
he says, O oh Lord, open my servant's eyes that he may see there are more with us than there are with him. You see, it's the same way today. How many angels fell with Lucifer? Only one third. That means two thirds are left. Now here's the difference. His beings are aggressive, deceptive, and they're moving around trying to mock God and draw people away from God. Look what he's doing. But we have two-thirds of angels that are standing, waiting to be dispatched. So God has things in control, but you wouldn't say, it doesn't look like that. No, he's waiting for the church to ask him to get involved. Get involved with my family. Get involved with that honorary brother. Get involved with that situation. Lord, I need you to get involved. You see, when you do that, God has full permission without resistance to function on your behalf. Hello? Amen. We think, oh, maybe we have to warrant that. No, you just have to ask for it. You'll never get to be perfect. Not till you get to heaven. So right now, God considers you a child of the kingdom. And there is a child of the kingdom that's suffering, and he's not asking for anything. And that's what the enemy's trying to do to the body of Christ, to get us to lay into a foxhole. Do you remember David, the shepherd boy, when he was a shepherd boy? And Goliath, the story, how that when he came down to bring his brothers lunch, they were all in holes, hiding out because his giant was in the land. And I, I'm just going to bring up this point. So David looks at him. He says, what are you doing hiding out? The armies of the almighty God are hiding in holes. I believe that's what the church has been in the last couple of years. We've been, because of this enemy, Goliath, COVID or whatever, a lot of people are having to revamp how they think and walk with God. Some people are hit out. You know, I'm not putting anything down. I'm just telling you, you have to reevaluate. You know what David say? He says, how can you let something like that scare the mighty church of God? So it's time for the church to rise up. It's time for us to really do what God asks us to do. In order for that to happen, we must have our eyes enlightened to the plans and purposes of God. Amen. So Ephesians 1, let's read it together. You can read along with me. It says, And Paul prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You see, you have a natural mind. And if you just read your Bible, that's good. But every once in a while, have you noticed that in a certain situation, you read your Bible and something leaps off the page and suddenly just talks to you? That is revelation. That's how God ministers his word to you in such a way that Satan can't take it away. He has to bypass your thinking and go into your spirit by revelation. Amen. A lot of times I'll read my Bible and my head doesn't quite grasp what he's saying. But all of a sudden it leaps off off the page and you go, that's what he means. And we'll show you that scripture here a little bit later on. And so as we consult with the Lord, God wants to give us and change our thinking by revelation knowledge. Can you say amen? And he says that he will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him so that the eyes of your understand, understanding being enlightened. So I was taught in Bible college, you get it here and it drops down into here. No. Who lives in your spirit? All right. So you got it here. It needs to flutter up into here. So if the enemy can keep you busy looking at everything else, you won't be able to relax to allow the revelation to bubble up from your spirit like a wellspring water and come into your understanding. That's why you fall asleep every time church comes. <laughs> or whenever you pick up your Bible, you get the nods. Come on, I'm only teasing you a bit. 
That's your flesh not wanting to get with the program. So you leave your flesh on the altar long enough for it to be dead. I mean, last, next week I got a little surprise with a, a funny jacket. We're going to go through some revelation things with you and, and some fun. Also, too, let me let you know we're going to do some deeper teaching on a Sunday afternoon concerning pre adamic age and the antediluvian age, pre-flood and all this kind of stuff, just to give you some nuggets to throw. Just simple little teachings for you to look up yourself, and we're going to give you the notes so you can stay tuned for that too, okay, all right? Let's go on now, so go with me. Further on down as we read 19, and what is the exceeding? God wants us to be full, enlightening. You may know what is the calling the hope of your calling and the riches of his glory, listen, of his inheritance where? You have an inheritance where? In the saints. Didn't say you have it in heaven. It says it has it in you. You have an inheritance there. You have a bill of lading that says you have this. Now, how are you going to get your hands on it? Meeting with God meeting with God. He shows you what steps to take. If you don't meet with God, then you're going to try. Okay, sirrah, sirrah, let me try it. You will be. Let me try a little of this, see if that works. Let me try a little of that. I mean, no, Christianity doesn't work that way. Now, you take steps of faith, you don't try it out. <laughs> Moving right along. Keep, keep with me. And then verse 19. Now, what is the exceeding greatness of his power? Toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. God wants us empowered. So if you're empowered, I say, God's power be with you. Don't say, it is. Say, yeah, I want more. How many here want, got everything you want? You don't. Let's get more. Amen. So if somebody wants to bless you, say, I want more. Yes. Nothing wrong with that. Amen. But there's something wrong with it. And I, used to, I started all this. I am. Somebody says, be blessed, brother. I am. What does that sound like? Pride. What does the spirit do? It resists the Pride. proud, gives grace to the. Oh. What did God tell us to do? Be humble and balanced. Humble and balanced. God's always there where you're humble. You get all uppity into yourself, and God will wait till you're done with your tantrum. Moving right along. <laughs> you still love me. Don't throw anything, Brian. All right. A couple of things I want to bring out. First of all, God wants us to operate with the spirit of wisdom. Yes. Being wise. Don't be in such a hurry to jump at something. Hastiness gets you into big trouble. Being first in line, trying to make everybody else see how wonderful you are. You are completely scoring zip diddle. Because it's all about you promoting God. Then God promotes you. But if you're looking to please the pastor, I'm only using me as a joke. You're not going to get any rewards in that. Because we're not to be doing it to be seen of men. Don't do it so men see how good you are. Just do it. People will notice what you're doing and why you're doing it because your motives are to love God and to love others. Say amen, somebody. So listen to this. James 3, 13 and 17. See, I'm not going to take the in-between verses. Verses 13, verse 17. James 3. Who is wise among you? Look around and say, God but you are too, because you have God in there. You have a potential of wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good deeds or conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. How many here really don't have a good idea what meekness is? How many of you have ever seen somebody big and tough? Like me. No. I'm sorry. I, I just thought, I have a certain amount of strength in my arms and legs and all, okay? So you put in a brand new sink with new washers. If I'm meek, I only use enough strength to shut that off gently. But if I'm not operating in meekness, I'll just turn it off like my faucets are all ripped up. 
you know, slam the door and just there's no grace or it's all, you know. Meekness is the ability to have strength, but to use only what's needed for the time. Like a horse, powerful animal, but when it's meeked, it will carry you and you can guide it with two little, you know, bridles. Hello? Amen. Be meeked. So God can guide you with the bridles of life and not have to jerk you about because you're so out in left field. <laughs> Some would say, oh my. All right, so amen. So listen to this. Who's wise and understanding among you? Let him show by a good conduct that his works are done in meekness of wisdom. Verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Your motives are pure. Peaceable. Gentle. Willing to be Willing to yield means you don't argue. Full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality. You don't treat anybody differently than anybody else. We'll treat the rich people one way and we'll treat the poor people one way. No, you treat everybody the way God wants them treated. No respect to a person. Say amen. You have to work on that one. Because we're creatures that have a tendency to judge. And we'll put something in a category and we'll just treat it that way and we'll find out that's not the way it is at all. Hello? You heard so-and-so was coming and then when they show up, you see them in the words that you heard rather than how you see them. And if you were shared negative about somebody, that negativity has a tendency to stay too long. And then when somebody introduces himself and you go, ba bum that's the person. Try to shove those thoughts back on down because your thinking is polluted by the suggestions of others commenting on someone else. For example, if you're going to comment on me, don't put my words in your mouth. Oh, I know the pastor. The pastor believes this. Don't ever say that. Don't talk for me. I won't talk for you other than all good. Can you say amen? But we have a tendency to describe things. Our church is good, but it's little. And we go on and describe all the negatives, and then we wonder why nobody's excited to come with you to church. Oh, yeah, we need to grow. Really need to grow. See, because people, you can, you can be driving down the highway and see a beautiful white picket fence, but the only thing about it, you're going to notice that one broken one in the center. People are like that. We're like that. So what we do is we get rid of the part that's like that, our flesh. Can you say amen? And we walk with God in the realm of the spirit, and we can do that on a daily basis. We can see through his eyes. We can hear through his ears. We can be encouragers. Wonderful. This wisdom comes from above. All right. You'll notice that you'll have a revelation in the knowledge of him. So what is revelation? Revelation in the knowledge of him is the Holy Spirit reveals to you truth of the word personally to our understanding, bypassing our own personal analytical reasonings and goes right into our heart with revelation, reveals. Word revelation is a big word which means to reveal something personal to you about the word and God. Can you say amen? And you want to build your life upon that rock. What did Jesus say? He said, who do men say that I am? You know, oh, some say you're Elijah, some John the Baptist. Come back. He says, but who do you say that I am? You've been hanging around me. Who am I? He says, you are the Christ, Peter said, the son of the living God. And he said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. And upon the revealing of that to you, upon this rock, I will build my church. Amen. Not central, general knowledge of Christ. He doesn't build it on the general knowledge of Christ. He builds it in people's hearts. You are lively stones built up a spiritual house to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God. Man, that's you. That's who you are. Get up in the morning, Father in Jesus' name, and you begin to converse that way. Hallelujah. So we need the revelation that bypasses Satan's interruption and confusion. 
Man, when God gives you something by revelation knowledge, Satan isn't even aware of it. Now, Satan knows he hears me preaching, listen, and he hears what I'm saying. Sometimes I wonder if he doesn't read my notes. You know what I mean? But he believes, Satan believes that you believe this word and that you are going to do this word. So immediately he starts working a plan to get this word out of you. So if you're a Christian and this goes to church, but you really don't pay attention, then your walk is way behind where you should be. Because God's been trying to reveal things to us, but how much have we been paying attention? And then when we get it, remember that that truth can never be taken from you. The truths that God reveals to you are yours for eternity. So you want as many of those as you can get. God revealing, God revealing to you. So that's why God told me to tell everybody, you meet with him, he'll condition you for that. But if you don't meet, from, meet with him on a regular first thing basis, you're going to harden up because that's the way the world's set up because people are attacking you and they're doing stuff. Makes us want to harden up. The only way to keep us moist, to keep us receptive, is to seek God first and his righteousness. All the rest is added unto you. Seek him first. I like the sound of that. <laughs> All right, so not only that, but Galatians, this is what Galatians says. Galatians 1, 11 says this. Beautiful scripture. But I make known to you, brethren, this is Paul talking to the church, the church is at Galatia, that the gospel which was preached by me was not according to man. I didn't go to Bible college. For I met, uh, but I, I love it. For I neither received it from man or was I taught it by man? But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, you know the story. He was in, in Acts chapter 9. Read about it. And he got knocked off his high horse. That's what will happen to you whenever you get full of yourself. You'll fall off your high horse. You don't want to do that, so stay humble. Stay close to the ground. Not false humility. Oh, poor me, poor me. No, just be humble. A humble person is a person is who God made them. They don't brag. They just live. Your life is a testimony. Can you say amen? All right. So, Galatians 1 again says, I make to known to you, brethren, that gospel which was preached by me was given to me by revelation. And then it says that the eyes of your understanding, the next part of that scripture, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened that we may see with what lenses we use. How do you look at things? Do you look at the in the natural? We have every right to do that. Or do we look at things through the spiritual or both? The idea is we do it both. But in a situation, let's see, there's problems. Maybe there's a, a, a problem or a situation. You can't really see what's going on, but you know who can? And that's why you go to him and you talk it out with him. And not all of a sudden as you're talking with him, he'll just let you know. He does it supernaturally. Ding. There's a peace and you know you got the answer. You can't see it. You still have, you're not there to see the result. But we're not going by our eyes, remember? We know and I know her. That God has already dealt with it. It's going to work, play itself out. So we just watch our P's and Q's so we don't get in the way of God working it out. Someone say, well, me. It's just one of those things. God, get me out of the way so that I work with you. Help me not to walk ahead of you or walk too far behind you to walk with you, Lord. Amen? Are you with me? It says, the eyes of our understanding be in the light that we may know and see through the lenses that we're given. Listen to this. Colossians 1, 9 and 10 says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, and that you may walk worthy of the Lord. See, everyone say, walk worthy of the Lord. 
How do I know I'm walking worthy of the Lord? Ephesians 1 says walk worthy of the call. It means you walk in the spirit. That's the only way you can walk worthy. And, and let's not make that so religiously spiritual. Walking from the, or walking in the spirit is simply walking from your heart, from the inside out. Instead of walking from the outside in like we did all our life, now we're learning to walk from God out. You see what I'm saying? And, you, and, and there's a song out there, from the inside out, from the inside out, from the inside out. Why? Because God is almighty and he dwells in you and I. So we need to let him go ahead of us and enlighten our path. Hello? Didn't he say that no one takes a light and puts it under a bushel or under a, a bed, but sets it on a lampstand so all that may enter the house can see the light? What's he talking about? He says, the God in you, take him and put him out in front. So wherever you go, the enlightenment of God is your testimony. Someone say amen. They don't see you as much as they see God's nature within you. All right. Then it says in verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Say, that's me. Doesn't sound too hard, does it? Walking separated from the old ways. How many of you remember, Christians, I have this always thing I preach. I always say it a lot and I probably haven't said it for a while, but Christians don't know if they're coming and going. First of all, because the Bible says, come out from among them, be separate, touch not the unclean thing, right? Come out from among them. Then the Bible says, go out into all, go into the, all the world and preach the gospel. So we come out to learn the kingdom, learn from God, just to go into the desert with the word of God, the gospel. We withdraw ourselves from the world, the world system. We get into God until he teaches us the ropes. Come unto me, all you that labor and are laden, and I will give you rest. Come, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. It's not learn of me. It's learn from me. That means you've got to be a one-on-one -on -one with God. Learn from me the way I want you to see the scripture. Hello? Remember the guy with the five talents? Remember the guy with the money? One had five talents, one had two talents, one had one talent. Remember the guy with the one talent? He had a bad concept in his thinking about God. He thought God was harsh. He thought God reaped where he didn't sow. And if you think about those statements, God doesn't ever do anything like that. He's perfect. So the man's concept of God was tilted and scarred. So when he acted on that understanding of God, he hid his money. He was afraid. He was telling people like Job did. You're an austere man. You reap where you don't sow. And you, you know, you know, you know, you know. there's plenty of people out there talking about God that way. And they have got no clue that they're not talking about the God that we have because he's perfect. We need to strain out the religious false teachings that are everywhere within the gospel. Now, I'm not picking, I'm just saying the little laces of what the enemy throws in there kind of gum up the works. Oh, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Not. The Lord gives. Hello? But he doesn't take what he gives you away. Now, we can, we can put it right. We can say the Lord gives us life and takes away our sin. We can throw that in there. But that song is really about if you don't behave yourself, I'm going to take your gifts away from you. That is not what God does. What will happen is you'll, you might not use your arm. You still have an arm, but your muscle tone is gone to pot. Hello. I broke my arm once and I had to relearn how to use it. My feet, relearn how to walk. You see. 
So God doesn't yank it from you. God is a spirit, and when he chastises us, he does it spiritually. He doesn't use a Mack truck to beat us into subjection. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That's Old Testament teaching. Remember the Old Testament, nobody had God in them. So anybody at any time could turn on God. And when they did, they got a big boo-boo. Grounds open up. I mean, fiery serpents sneaking into the camp. Aren't you glad you're in the New Testament? Amen. Amen. We, we, they were gossiping and speaking bad about God. Snakes came in and bit them. Now, here's the New Testament interpretation. You gossip and you become negative. You'll have more problems like serpents and it'll keep biting you. You don't want that to happen. Say amen. That, that won't cost you anything. It's the truth. I mean, all these 40 some odd years I've been teaching the word. You do not tell. You know what tail bearing is versus gossip? I'm going to do this real quickly. Tail bearing is telling people of what you're going through all the time. You're bearing a tail to people who don't need to know. Let me tell you all about my past. Do the person you're talking to really need to know that? That's a tail bearing. Or when Jonathan, Jonathan's servant comes and tells that Jonathan is dead, I forget who it was. Uh, no, it was Absalom. And when the servant came in, his Absalom is dead. He killed the servant too for bringing bad news. Remember the 12 spies, 10 versus the two? So you got the idea. God doesn't want us in our own functioning in that realm. He wants us functioning in the realm that know that God is in us. He's side by side with us. He's for us. And he's with us. Not only that, top that all off. I know you love to go into those yogurt places. To top it all off. <laughs> you are in God. When you get up and meet with God, God places you in him. You get up from that realm and you walk through your day, Satan just sees Jesus. Until you open your mouth, start screaming and yelling and, and, and flagging yourself, saying, it really isn't Jesus, just me in here. Sure, every man's tempted when he's drawn out of God in, by his own lusts. Amen. And enticed. We all have our flesh. There's all those little things, come on, that, that pick at you. But you've got to remember something. You just ask God those little weaknesses that you might have. You ask God to help those little areas, and you'll change. My wife loves me more today. <laughs> Moving right on. You got it, didn't you? Okay, so Ephesians chapter 4, listen to this, 17 and 18. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the fruitlessness of their mind, having their understanding being darkened. Read Romans 1 sometime. It'll let you know that God gave them the truth, but they refused it, so they became darkened. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Who is the one that blinds the minds of them that believe not? Satan does. So the moment you get into your own reasoning and everything, he starts blinding you. What happened to Paul when he was on the road to Damascus, fell off the high horse, and what fell from his eyes? Scales. That he would be blinded. Amen. You can relate it to love. You can be so infatuated with somebody, you can't even see that there's, they really don't have a personality. <laughs> they don't even like you. They just want to be with you. <laughs> I rebuke that. All right, let's move right on. <laughs> At least I get you to laugh a little bit, okay? All right, amen. So, listen to this script. A couple of points. But I'm going to give you, I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, excuse me, chapter 6, and just put your finger there. Second Corinthians chapter 6, put your finger there, and listen to these two points. Number one, 
have the right understanding of God. Because you couldn't represent somebody if you don't understand him. First of all, God is not mad at the world anymore. And we hear people all the time saying, God's sending judgment. He's going to judge this and he's going to judge that and everything. They don't even know, have got a clue a lot of times what they're saying. They're pulling it out of the Old Testament and they're likening it into the Roman government and they're going all through this. What is God saying to you? What are you supposed to be doing within the body of Christ in the position and the place and in the territory that God puts you? Your job is not to call down fire and judgment. <laughs> Your job is to win souls and touch lives. And Satan is nervous because he knows a revival is here. We are in the revival. But the church has to take up the cause. We got to get off our derriere and do some things. Instead of focusing on our problems all the time. Best way to forget about your problems is to help somebody with theirs. And a funny thing, while you were doing that, God did yours. As a man soweth, so shall he reap. So let's go on. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 through 18, it says, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? By the way, your body is the temple of God. You are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. Say amen. amen. I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be to a, a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. So, don't compromise. Here we have Christians that are, are walking with God, and then all of a sudden they've got a few things bunch of victories and I've seen it happen hundreds of times they'll sit back and they'll go back into some of their old habits because they figure they came this far I can party a little bit don't do that because let me remind you when you punch Satan he has a counter punch for you that's what the armor is for so that if he tries to counter punch you he'll whack towards God and God he will doom himself but if you're not ready, you lay everything down, you're sort of doing your own thing, you decide you're going to hang at Kelly's bar or whatever. Now, I'm not condemning people when they make their choices because we're here to win souls and touch lives. So I'm not here to slam bad habits and all that kind of stuff because everybody has them. Just some of us hide them differently. No, I'm joking. With you. <laughs> Come on. I'm just trying. So that's why we have God so that God can help clean that out of us. We're talking about the flesh here. We're not in your spirit. You have God. There's no sin in there. You cannot sin from your spirit. Because the seed remaineth in you. First John 3. Because God lives in you, he doesn't sin. But your flesh does whenever you're not walking with God. It will look for a little thing it can get away with. Hey, I'm going to have that. Think about that. How silly that looks to God. Oh, here we go. You know, so we can all be honest with ourselves and stay humble and balanced. But here's what happens. A lot of people, once they get on their, their, their ease, they start to move into disqualification. They start to disqualify themselves. Not from God, from their victory. They lay down and Maybe pour themselves a beer and just kind of bay back and everything. While meanwhile, the enemy's scurrying around, setting up things. No, seek God. Ask him. God, you really want me to be doing this? You know, I mean, just ask him. It's okay. He's not a condemner. He might say no. He said, well, you're going to have to help me because, man, I'm tired. When I come home, I need to relax. So I want to do Well, you need to have God work that out of you. Because what that does is it often gets you out of your umbrella. How many know that up in Washington, we have a thing called rain? 
And a lot of us have these big umbrellas. Have you ever seen the umbrella that goes all the way down? It's, a big, it's like a big dome, and it's got a big clear thing. You can look through it, or it's all clear. An umbrella like that. Well, you got one that goes all the way to the ground. But when you get to doing your own thing, you go out from under that grace into the rain. I'm just using rain for an expression. So it rains on the just and the unjust if they're not paying attention. And a lot of us are conditioned like Washingtonians. Ah, it's just the rain. I don't care if I get wet. You can't do that with God's walk. Ah, oh, it's just the devil, you know. You know, it's just part of life. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. God has made you kings and priests. God has set you up for eternity. God doesn't want a devil messing with his kids. And, you know, God's hands are semi-tied because you have a will. And if you're willing to let the enemy do that to you, it will happen to you. Why did that person do that? But God, why didn't God stop him? He probably did the best he could to get the person's attention. But if you want to do something bad enough, that peanut butter barfay, you're going to get it. The idea is to get God working in you so your body doesn't crave the very things you become addicted to. Here's to you. Really, you guys are wonderful, but think about how we're wired, how we function. I, I teach this way so that you can teach others also. It isn't me teaching and entertaining you with words. This church is known by the quality of its word. And the love of the people. That's what we're known for. Word is what we're all built around. You can get praise. Praise is good. But if you're not in the word, your praise will be gone. And then you go under a trial. It's the word that sustains us. Hearing it and doing it. Hearing it and doing it. Hearing it and doing it. The foundation of God comes up underneath our feet. And he's the one that exalts us in due season. If we stay humble. Let's go to my next point. Being transformed, we know it by the renewing of our mind. We got bad thinking, we need to get in and transform our thinking. Periodically, you have run you down thoughts. I'm nothing. I'm a stupid. I'm not. If you have thoughts run through your mind like that, don't raise your hand. That's the devil that using your voice in your mind to condemn you. God did not come into this world to condemn it. He came to save it. So when your thoughts are self-condemning, even if you blew it, those are not your thoughts. It might be your voice, but it's the devil saying, you're an idiot. You're stupid. You always keep doing the same thing. Oh, when you hear that stuff, rebuke it. I am not. I'm a child of God. As soon as you say that, everything, all those thoughts will go away. Because you can be thinking one thing and just open your mouth and your thoughts will stop to hear what your mouth has to say. So the next time you're feeling a little blue, open your mouth and say, well, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. And next thing you know, you feel your countenance start to build up and you feel yourself start to fill with the presence of God. Why? Because you're acting on the word of God instead of surrendering to the suggestions of the enemy. Go to the beginning. What did Satan suggest to Adam and Eve in the garden? Oh, God did not really say. He gave them an alternative and they bid on it. Hello. What did Satan do with Jesus in the wilderness and the temptations? He was trying to convince Jesus to quit. So do you think the devil's changed his status, his tactics? No, periodically it's going to put things on you like this. Quit. It's going to make you tough. That's why you meet with God. You pray over your jobs, your businesses, your family, your church. And watch God just continue to bless. But when we stop and try to analyze things, that's where we mess up. 
<clears throat> or analyzing things is probably not quite enough insight. But God looks 360 all the time. Never sleeps. Always concerned about us and our well-being. Let's let God do his job and let's do ours rest. Amen. So you know the scripture, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed or pressed into the mold of the world, but be transformed, transfigured, trans, transfigured, I think it's the best word, be transfigured by the renewing of your mind. So you replace your old thoughts with the new thoughts, old thoughts with the new thoughts. You did it that way when you're older, I mean younger, but you're still doing it that way now. Better replace your thoughts because it's not working. Hello. We got some people, they feel they're threatened with change comes to their life and says, you really need to change that. And they feel threatened. So they be stubborn at the wrong time. <laughs> I'm not going to change. Well, then you're going to go through trials. And if you keep going, you're going to be just like that person that falls on the rock and it crushes you like powder. You're going to find things missing and things not working like the way. And you, you're going to find yourself saying, I wish it was like that again. Well, then next time, listen to God before you take the wrong trail and do your own thing. For there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Stop doing it our way. I did it my way. <laughs> my wife says, oh no, oh no. All right. Are you with me? A couple of points I want to give you. Number one, we're transformed by our exposure to God in the word. So how's your exposure? You need to be radiated by God every day. Two, when we begin to see and understand the way God wants us to, we see that nothing's impossible to him that believeth. You see a challenge to a Christian, it's a stepping stone to success. The two spies, they got to go into the promised land while the ten mouth the obvious. We're like grasshoppers in the sight. That means you haven't got any faith. Hello. God, you see, we don't fight ourselves. You fought, and then you surrendered to Jesus. You became a child of God. You see, the Israelites won all those battles over all those giants. The promised land was filled with Anakims and Mamiasins and all the other parasites and all the world giants and Nephilim. And God says, get rid of them all. But see, they knew their God. They realized that they weren't fighting them in their own strength. That God was fighting for them. Hello. Make note of that. And then finally, fall in love with God's word. I'm concerned because in the United States, I see there is a anemic, and there is, people are anemic to the word of God. They don't understand it. They, they, when you ask them about stuff, they quote a religious statement rather than the word. Hello? And I'm, I just want to make sure we know the word, folks. Amen? And the word comes down like snow and rain. And waters the earth. So shall my word that go forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. But it shall water your hearts and it shall fill you. And it shall accomplish in the thing, you, the vessel, where God has sent it. Amen? And so we need to fall in love with the word again. We, it's many distractions. It's the word of God that writes and anchors our soul. Listen to what Proverbs tw uh, 3, verse 21 through 26, and then finishing. My son, let, let my words not depart from your eyes. In other words, you've got to keep another vision in front of you. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. For they will be life to your soul <laughs> and grace to your neck. Then when you walk, you'll walk safely in your way and your foot will not stumble. 
I don't know about you, but stumbling's not a good thing. Go to the doctor. First thing they ask you is, did you fall? <laughs> Thank you. How about how am I? <laughs> All right. Anyway, moving right along. Then it says, and you shall walk safely in your way, and your foot shall not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. There's Psalms 91 in there too. Okay. Yes, you will lie down and listen, you need to claim this. Your sleep will be sweet. I woke up this morning so joyous and so sweet. Man, it was like I prayed all night. But that's God's doing. I think it has to do with consistency. Are you a consistent Christian? Or are you just kind of quesera, you know, whatever you can? A lot of Christians, the only time they pray is when they're in trouble. Hello. And then they'll get up and they say, I hope, hopefully, I, I hope God heard me. I'm going, oh, man. All right, listen. Do not be afraid of sudden terror, nor of trouble by the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being snared or caught. Second, uh, First Timothy chapter 4 says, meditate on these things. Everything I said so far, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. People need to see that you're growing. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, the teachings. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those that hear you. My concern was for a while, did I have people that could repeat and mimic what I do? Paul said it this way, be an imitator of me as I follow Christ. He actually said that once. He says, if you don't have an example of a godly person, I'll try to be that example for you. Now, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I'm your pastor and I live a godly life the best as I can. But, uh, but we need to see examples of people actually getting victorious things. We need to hear testimonies. We need to encourage one another. Can you say amen? And we need to consult the word because the word will cut through all the junk by the help of God's revelation in the spirit. If you got something out of this morning, would you give the Lord praise? Amen. amen.